number 91, matter of Krug, the city of Buffalo. Council? Uh, good afternoon, your honors. May it please the court. David Lee, Assistant Corporation Counsel, here on behalf of the appellant, city of Buffalo. Uh, Chief Judge, may I please request one minute rebuttal time? You may, sir. They say that a picture says a thousand words. In this case, we have a 30 second long video clip. So the question is then, is it a complete picture following up on your metaphor? I, I, I think that it is, Judge Fahey, because everything that is seen on that video is what forms the basis of Devin Ford's civil complaint against the city of Buffalo. Well, let, so, let me ask you this. Has <coughs> uh, Officer Krug, uh, subsequently to this uh, determination, had criminal charges brought against him, and he was acquitted two times by a jury trial, right? He was acquitted out one time, Your Honor, one time? and then okay. the, on the retrial. On the retrial. And uh, <coughs> um, uh, since that determination has uh, the Corporation Counsel's Office reconsidered its original determination based on his acquittal? Uh, no, 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 we have not, Your Honor, because they are, they are separate issues. And although the indictment was one piece of information that the Corpor Corporation Counsel relied on in forming his decision, mm -hmm. that certainly wasn't the only piece of information. Well, the, way, the way I read it, and you can correct me because you know the record better, but I thought there were two pieces of uh, information that they relied on. First was uh, the indictment, and the second was the video, right? That's correct. Okay, so the indictment has been found not guilty. So now you've got the video, and the video is a 30 second video, and it's certainly not favorable to Officer Krug, but you would grant that that's a rather short period of time to make an ultimate determination on. I, I, I don't think it is, Judge, and, and here's why. It, okay. In a normal case, there, there, there would never be a video. Um, this is a rare situation where there is a video. So where there is no video, what are you doing? You're out there, you're interviewing witnesses, you're obtaining documents, you're trying to figure out exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. But when there's a 30 second video of what happened and what's on that 30 second video, and this is key, I think, that those are the facts that form the basis of Ford's civil complaint. Yes, but so this was based on allegations, un as yet unproven in a federal indictment, to Judge Fahey's point, with very short, few seconds, 30 seconds on a video, and the filing, as I understand it, of the disciplinary charges. Is that fa a fair basis on which to deny someone a defense? I, I, I think it is, Chief Judge, because, I, and I'll, I'll keep, I don't mean to repeat myself, but everything that Ford complains about in his civil complaint is shown in that 30 second video clip. In other words, Ford's civil complaint has nothing to do with Krug's initial decision to interfere between Mr. Ford and whoever else was, was out in that street. It's, it's the way he went about it that, that is the issue that takes him outside the scope of his employment. Um, so you're pointing to a couple of portions of the city code that give the Corporation Council some discretion. But when I look at Section 1, it says, notwithstanding any provision of basically any other kind of law, why do you think that um, there's any discretion that we owe? And is, isn't this just a state statute that we have to interpret? No, no, I, I don't think it is, Judge. And I think the, the, this court's decision in Salino makes clear that uh, when there is a state statute that provides for defense and indemnification, that's one thing. But when there's also a local ordinance, as there is in the city of Buffalo, which gives the Corporation Council the discretion in the first instance to determine whether an employee was acting in the scope of his employment. It's an arbitrary and capricious standard, and the Corporation Council makes that decision. Well, the state statute, uh, you know, um, Section 50J, it looks as if only in Section 6 is there discretion given to the local authority, uh, not in Sections 1 or 2, which is the ones you're relying on, in 6B. I guess, I guess the discretion, Your Honor, comes from, does come from the city code. I would agree that that section 50J, Division <coughs> 1, doesn't say anything about the Corporation Council determining anything in the first instance. Subdivision 6 does, you're correct. But again, I would point to the, the Salino case decided by this, by, by this court where I think it was Suffolk County who had to defend and indemnify. It, 
the, the, the issue of defense identification was governed by state statute, but because Suffolk County had a, a local ordinance that provided the Corporation Council makes that determination in the first instance, this court decided that it was an arbitrary and capricious standard, and the Corporation Council did, did have that discretion. Council, just to go back a, a little bit to some of what Judge Fahey was asking you. So let's say in a case where you just base this on the indictment, and then there's an acquittal. Would that affect the decision that the city made? I'm not, I'm not sure that, that it would, because I, I don't view that the, the issues are separate, right? I mean, so you have a, a criminal trial, an acquittal, that crew was found not guilty um, beyond, beyond a reasonable doubt, and in, in, in the civil context, you have the scope of employment issue. So they're totally, they're, they're different issues, and I don't view. So if, uh, if, if, if the civil, if in the civil trial they found that it was within the scope of employment, what would that mean? Would the city then possibly have to indemnify um, the officer uh, for any damages uh, assessed against him, or would they have to go back and then reimburse him for his defense, or, or, I, I was, or neither I was, one? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was, I was thinking about that, and I'm not sure that I have that answer totally prepared. I think that it would, it would create an issue. It would be an interesting issue if a jury did ultimately determine that, that Krug acted in the scope of his employment, what effect that would have on indemnity? I don't think it's before this court right now, and I'm not sure that I have a, a, a great so answer. So scope of employment in, in the city's um, view is not the issue here. The issue was, was the basis of the determination the intentional wrongdoing or the violation of the department's rules. I'm, I'm a little confused about that, or is it all of them? Well, I, I think, I, I, it, I think it's a little bit of everything, but I think what I really want to focus on here is, is just the, the scope of employment issue and what 50J says. Was Corey Krug on that video, does that show him per performing a public duty for the benefits of the citizens of the community? That is the standard in 50J. How, I don't understand, that, if, if you take a look at that video and what, what Mr. Krug does on that video, how can anyone respectfully look at that video and say, oh, that's a public duty performed for the benefits of the citizens of the community. So the question is, is whether there's any basis in fact for that determination. Is that, is that, is that the standard that? Yeah, and, and, and that is the standard, Your Honor. I, I'm, I don't want to suggest that Mr. Krug doesn't have reasonable arguments. He very well may. But what I'm saying is the Corporation Council also has reasonable arguments. And well, did, did you, did, what investigation was made? Did you just look at the video and make the determination? Was there any other investigation? Did was, you talk to other officers? Did you get affidavits from other officers? What was done? Tell me about the investigation. It was it was view, viewing the, the video, Judge. And, and the indictment? Yes. Those and were, that was it? Yes. And that's, and that's, I think, why I wanted to start off, and I, cause I think that's what Mr. Cruz's main argument is. Well, the video's not enough. It doesn't have enough context. But, you know, the video shows, shows enough, in my opinion. To, well, you, you, the problem is it's not just the video that, that you've, you've lost half the basis of your decision. Um, <clears throat> um, by the by, the acquittals. You know what I'm wondering is you, you said you, I think Judge Stein asked you about it. Did, <clears throat> have you made any determination as to whether or not you're going to indemnify Krug in the civil lawsuit? No, Judge. I see. There's the I see. So uh, how about a defense? The, the, usually, in an insurance situation, the uh, um, obligation to defend is broader than the obligation to indemnify. Has there been any determination been made there? On the, on the issue of defense, Your Honor? Yeah. I, well, there, there has been a determination. And this carries over, in other words, all oh. the way to the civil suit is what you're saying. Yes, yes. Okay. So if, if the obligation to defend um, has been determined in the civil suit, then I'm assuming that you've, the, the city's also decided not to indemnify. That would probably be the, be, be the way that it goes, Your Honor, yes. Uh, so, so in this situation, uh, plaintiff's counsel uh, could decide uh, uh, not to defend the case, or you know, well, I'm saying well, Krug's counsel could decide not to defend the case in exchange for a guarantee that no recovery would be had from Krug's assets. Um, Krug could default on a complaint refuse to challenge an inquest on damages. This happens all the time with plaintiffs. And then uh, um, uh, whatever inquest is put in, um, the agreement would be that you would go against the city rather than go against Krug directly. Um, um, is the city prepared for that? In other words, is you don't know. You know. 
Okay. Uh, All right. Thank I, you. I have a slightly different question. Can this case be resolved uh, without resort to the Buffalo City Code? I, I don't think that it, that, that it can, Your Honor, only because my understanding of, of the posture here is that this is, this is an Article 78 proceeding. It is an arbitrary and capricious standard, and I think that directly stems from the, the city code. And both sides have proceeded under that assumption. Yes, that, that's, that has not been an issue thus, thus far. Thank you, Council. Okay, thank you. Council? May it please the court, my name is Ian Hayes. I represent the petitioner, Corey Krug. Uh, Chief Judge, I'd just like to answer a question that you brought up um, because I think it's the most important thing that just came up. The, uh, I, there's no dispute in the record that the Corporation Council made the decision uh, not to defend and indemnify Officer Krug based only on the existence of the indictment and the 28 second video. The, there's nothing in the record indicating that they made the decision based on the filing of disciplinary charges. Um, I don't think there's anything in the record even showing when charges were mm -hmm. filed. So um, I believe the appropriate analysis is whether uh, the city had a rational basis based on uh, the indictment and the 28 second video. So he uh, argues what that- about, Excuse me, what about your colleague's question that um, the videotape was lined up squarely with the allegations that you make, and that's what their determination was made, and they really don't need any more. Uh, just so I understand, the, that the video was lined up squarely with what with Ford the, alleges, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that answers uh, the issue here, because uh, the video still doesn't show the beginning of the encounter, the end of the encounter, what led up to it or what happened after it. All can of that you point to any cases, I, I haven't found any, maybe, maybe there are, where, um, where we've held that something was arbitrary and capricious because there wasn't additional investigation or because there was conflicting evidence. It seems to me that the, the mere fact that we're talking about conflicting evidence means that there are two reasonable views of what it is. And, and, and it's basic administrative law that says that that's not arbitrary and capricious as long as there's some basis there, some factual basis. And it seems to me that, that this video provides that. Right. Well, with respect, Your Honor, I don't think that that is quite the question here. I think it's a very close one. It's, the question is whether, not, you know, the, not whether the Corporation Council made the proper decision in January 2016 when it decided to deny Officer Krug's request. Uh, it's whether it had enough information to make that decision in the first place. So I, I have been... So what information would he have had to have other than the video? I, I don't have a concrete and complete answer to that, Your Honor. I think Did any you make sort a record below of information that should have been considered, um, that you'd encourage us to look at to consider um, uh, in contrast to the video? I, w the question is, is there anything in the yeah. record? Yeah. Uh, no, Your Honor, because the, the record proceeded in a very simple and straightforward way. Usually in these situations, there'd be affidavits <clears throat> from other police officers. Um, uh, people who had been at the bars before, there'd be some kind of, something like that. Right, there, uh, there's no dispute that the city did no investigation before it made its mm -hmm. decision. And that's a crucial part of why. So when you went before Judge Dillon, did you offer any affidavits like that to say that, um, um, that, that this was clearly arbitrary because it was such a short snippet of time and here's this other proof? I understand. The answer is no, Your Honor, because I thought it was sufficient just to point out that, you know, there was no argument over how the Corporation Council made its decision, mm -hmm. and we proceeded on just based on the argument that that was not enough but, in itself. So but I thought really what you, your argument is that um, just watching the actual fight or the actual beating, let me just call it that, doesn't explain why the officer acted in this way. Correct, and that, Your Honor. And that that's what they should have investigated. Even if one looks at the video and says, that's excessive force, you can't do that. Did the officer have some reason to explain why he took this particular type of violent action? 
Absolutely. So that they could then decide whether or not, even taking that into account, it still falls outside the scope of his employment. Absolutely, Your Honor. That's been our position all along. And the okay, for so that, then what? What's the story? What what, does, what's the story? Yes. What, what does your client say? Is what would well, allow him to conduct himself this way? Right. So even though uh, there isn't much in the in our record in this case about that. There was, of course, a robust record uh, in federal court when these criminal charges were tried. And what came out from that, if I may, even though it's not in the record here, is that uh, Ford and his friends got kicked out of a bar for fighting. They were fighting in the street. Buffalo police officers had to break them up using pepper spray uh, and explicitly told them to you know, leave the area and stop fighting. Uh, Ford and his friends again started fighting and again had to be broken up. Um, after the video, it happened again, uh, at, at least one other time. And by what, the way, this is not based on uh, testimony. This is based on video from the same news crew that shot the short video. on. So, which so your position is there's case law that would say a provocation of an officer in the way you have identified it would mean that despite the video showing heinous violence, that it still falls within the scope of employment. Your Honor, we didn't brief whether there's like criminal case law on that point, so I don't want to say definitively yes or no to well, that. Well, wouldn't but that be what they'd have to take into consideration? I, I Is there going so. to be an argument for this conduct falling within the scope of employment? So what's the legal case law that supports that either way? I believe so, Your Honor, because that's the nature of police work, that right. police officers had, have very broad discretion in what they do, and they have a wide range of responsibilities. And one single act can be acting within <clears throat> the But you agree of, if it's unprovoked? Or is it your uh, position? No, I, I shouldn't say Your that. Honor, I can't agree with that based on the information that I personally know about from the criminal So trial. what is your understanding of the case law that, about what would have happened before the violent response that would bring the officer's actions within the scope of his employment. My understanding is that um, Ford was directly ordered not to fight with people in the street mm -hmm. and dis physically and by his actions disobeyed that police order. So, so, so to take it just the next step, what you're saying is that even though this video clip showed him sitting on the hood of a car and then being not apparently fighting with anybody at that second in time, right? And then pushed to the ground and you know, pretty violently uh, assaulted at that moment. That would have been okay if he had been fighting a couple of minutes earlier. I think it's, I think, Your Honor, the, the answer is that it could theoretically be. Is because this of the a nature scope of, of employment determination? Is that what we're talking about here? Yes, I think all so of these questions go to that. would this be analogous to the difference between, coincidentally, a prison situation where you have a fight between inmates and a guard rushes in to break it up and uses excessive force? Not that that's okay, not that that's a good thing but that that might be within the scope of employment, as opposed to a guard just gratuitously goes into a prisoner's cell and beats a prisoner for personal, you know, personal vendetta. Is that kind of the difference we're talking about here? Absolutely, Your Honor. And, and is your point that what led up to it doesn't justify excessive force necessarily, assuming even this is the case, but that it creates a situation where the excessive force resulted from a scope of the employment activity? More or less, Your Honor. I think we don't have to even answer the question. Nobody in this room has to answer the question of whether Officer Krug did his job properly or well. Uh, it's, the question is, did the Corporation <coughs> Council have the information to answer that question itself in January 2016? Did, did they know at that time oh. that um, the victim was not charged? Um, I, I don't know, Your Honor, because... But that is correct. That the, that the victim was not charged. Was charged. Was oh, not charged uh, that's correct, Your Honor. As a result of whatever may have happened that evening. Right. Let's just but put it that way. As, as you heard, Would though, that change the calculation if they did take that into consideration, if they knew that in advance? Would that change the, the analysis in this case, you're asking? Yes. 
Yes, um, that's fair. It, it could because it would be a step towards taking some investigation into what happened rather than just relying on a, a video and an indictment. It would be more information and provide slightly more context. I, personally, how I don't. Much, how much information is necessary? They have to do a full investigation of the case, or you know, where 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 should we draw that line if we agree with you? Right. I, I understand, Your Honor. I think that's a difficult question. I think this in this case, it clearly wasn't enough. Um, but the rule you also doesn't have to be. It? You have to investigate everything. I, mean, I, I think I the rule is you have to have you have to investigate enough to have an adequate understanding of the context of the allegations that are being so, made. So let me ask you this. If, if they had uh, provided him with a defense, and in the meantime, uh, the criminal case is going on, you're doing discovery in the civil case, uh, and assuming you're not staying the discovery uh, to see the outcome of the criminal case, and he's convicted in the criminal case, uh, at that point, can the city come in and say, you know what, uh, we're not going to defend you any further, uh, and you're stuck with however we ran the uh, discovery proceedings up until then. I mean, you know, and the, what's motivating this question is my experience in the city court down in New York City, where sometimes you'd be two or three years into the case, uh, and yes, cases unfortunately took that long sometimes. Uh, and then the city would disclaim uh, or you know, send a, a notice to the police officer saying, we're not going to defend you. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting scenario. Obviously, it's not before us here. Well, but, uh, I, I understand it's not the case before us, but uh, you can understand that there's a benefit to having that early assessment uh, so that if your client's going to end up with no coverage, uh, at least he can control who he hires, who he gets uh, to control the discovery process. Uh, yes, Your Honor, and I agree. Uh, I, I think if the city had proceeded in that way that you just described in that sequence, then um, they would have had a much stronger argument that the decision not, you know, at that point, not to defend or indemnify Officer Krug had a rational basis, unlike here. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Thank you. Counsel? Uh, yes, I'd like to close on this point. There seems to be this issue about, well, what happened before the video? Not enough context. Well, let me just draw a <coughs> hypothetical for the court, if I may. Imagine you have a police officer who has a legitimate law enforcement reason to make an arrest. And everything's fine at that point. But then let's say this particular suspect is in handcuffs, maybe he's put in the back of a police car, and then he gets punched in the face. Now, would anyone say that the punching is within the scope of employment, even though... But, but it's your position that excessive force is always outside the scope of employment as a matter of law? No, Judge. Okay, so no. isn't that really a question in your hypothetical, though, that's extenuated here? But we don't know what happened right before this. And if, for example, this was this altercation, the police go in, they're pulling these people over, and then this happens right away after that as part of this kind of disrupting this melee, why wouldn't you need to know that to look at this video to make a determination of whether this is in the scope of employment, not whether or not it's excessive force, because that's why they want to recover, right? But whether or not it's scope of employment, because we have those cases that say if this is part of the job and then it escalates into excessive force, scope of employment. But I guess you have to look at what are the allegations actually in Ford's civil complaint. But he's going to allege they have not, excessive force, but right? They have, but, well, it, yes, but they also have nothing to do with what the initial, Krug's initial response was, which was, again, maybe Krug had a legitimate law enforcement reason in the beginning to actually intervene between Mr. Ford and whoever this other guy in the street is, but then he totally crossed the line. But it and seems like, and I've been looking at it this way too, I think, but it seems like that's merging excessive force allegations with scope of employment because use of excessive force can be within the scope of employment. It's just a liability issue, right? It's not, was this good or not? So of course in the complaint, you're gonna get allegations of this is excessive force. Why would they be doing anything else there? But in this context, you need to look at what's the liability issue for the city. So you need to know, was that a result of 
the scope of duty excessive force or was it gratuitous, let's call it, right? Yeah, exactly. I think that's why I tried, what, with my example, I tried to sort of, that's probably even a more extreme example with the handcuffing, Blackfoot police car punch. That's right. totally gratuitous. That would be outside the scope of employment. I'm saying the situation is not far off. And maybe Krug had a legitimate reason to intervene to begin with. But, but how do you know that? Because there's no, it could be two seconds before this video, what happens? You don't know that. You never looked at it. I, I guess what I'm, what I'm saying, Your Honor, is I, I would even assume for purposes of your question that, that Officer Krug did have a legitimate reason to become involved in whatever was going on in, in, between Devin Ford and the other individual on the street. But that, then he totally crossed the line. I think he stepped outside the scope of his employment just as a police officer who hit, hits a handcuffed suspect. Boy, that that's not proper that's not the proper discharge of your duties that is totally crossing the line and that officer should not expect the corp the, the taxpayers to pay for his defense counsel the red light is off so i just have two quick questions one is did um corp counsel know that the charges that no charges had been filed against the victim mr ford well i would i would i would say that this your honor in the video Ford, when he's hitting, I'm sorry, Mr. Krug, when he's hitting Ford, is saying, get up, get up. And then you do see Ford. Walk away? Walk away. Okay. But, oh, so you're not, but you're not able to answer my question. Is that? Well, I guess my other response would be also <clears throat> that when the decision was made from the Corporation Council to not defend Krug, um, there was some time that had passed between the incident and. Okay. And then the other question is generally these uh, scope of employment decisions are very or determinations are very much fact-driven. If, if it's really just a question of fact as to what happened in advance, what the reaction is, not what's on the video, the video speaks for itself, as they say, but what might have, a, a, a what occurred before the video and how one might view that. If it's a fact question, does that change the analysis in terms of what counsel has to do when they're determining whether or not they'll provide the defense? I, I, I don't think so, Judge. I think that, and I, I think you're probably right, that there's always going to be different interpretations that a video is, is subject to. So someone might look at a video and see one thing, and someone might look and see another thing. But this is an, an Article 78 proceeding. And as long as the Corporation Council's interpretation of the video is not totally irrational, which I would submit to this court it's not, then I think that the, the, the order of the Fourth Department should be reversed. Thank you, Counsel. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome.